Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Are we turned on back there, young man? Turn me up. I've got to teach real softly. I want you to get this. I don't know how far I'll go with it. In fact, I don't even know where I'm going. All week long, the Lord just kept giving me one, one thing He wants me to talk about. One thing. He wants me to talk to you about the love of God. Too many times we think that the love of God is based on our merits, what we do. You can't do one thing to deserve the love of God. Not one thing. Let me, let, me, let me begin to take this thing apart and put it together. John 3.16, what, is, what does it say? Who, who did? Did it say Jesus? Who did it say? God so? The world. What did he have to do? He had to give something. And I begin to look at this, begin to look at this, and I've read, I've read passages of scriptures over and over and over. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. And I begin to look at this. So it says, okay, it says, God loved the world so much that when Adam and Eve sinned, they actually lost. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't show his love anymore like he wanted to. In the Old Testament, you'll notice a lot of judgment in, in the Old Testament. Not as, you know, in the New Testament, it become love. And uh and I begin to, begin to look at this. God loved the world before it was created. And I, and, and I just sit and, and begin to uh, contemplate in my mind. What did they talk about, the three? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What did they talk about prior to creating the world? I would like to have been there. In fact, he tells me I was. He said, I knew you before the foundation of the world. So apparently I was around there somewhere. And uh, so the conversation began to pick up. Son, we're going to create a world. Okay, okay, Dad, what are we? here's what I want you to do. I want you to speak into existence. See, the Father had the thought Jesus had the words, the Holy Spirit, and the angels carried it out. The Father just thought the words, because you remember what, what the Jesus, see, you've got to know the workings of Jesus. He made this statement on earth, but too many people just put it on the, the three and a half years he was here. That's the only time it happened. No, this started from the beginning. I won't do anything till I see you do it. I won't say anything till I hear you say it. This started this, this very time right here. Jesus, see what it was, God the Father loved the world so much that he wanted a family. He wanted a family. Then all of a sudden Jesus says, you know what the family's going to do? They're going to turn their back on you. They're going to sin to the point that you can't, you can't hug them no longer. You can't walk with them in the cool of the day. See, I know that. You know Satan's going to turn his back upon you. He's going to try to take your throne because he said, I'm going to try to, I will exalt my throne above your throne. I'm going to exalt myself. He said, you know, all this is going to be taking place. He said, I know that. But you will become my payment. Okay, Father, whatever, whatever you want, I'll become your payment. What, what is it? Then they begin to explain, this thing's going to come apart. I can no longer Hug my family no longer. I've lost the privilege of telling my family and holding them and showing them how much I love them. I can't do it. 
Then Jesus, you know, we pick up the time and down the road. Then Jesus came to this earth. See what it was? The Father had the love, but he needed, he needed the payment to be able to show the church what he's done. Without the payment, he couldn't fulfill his love. Someone had to make the payment. And so one would qualify, that would be his own son. That's the only one that could make the payment. The only one. Nobody on earth could make that payment. Nobody else in heaven could make that payment. It had to be his own son. See, if you read Ephesians, it it shows you, it'll tell you that. Ephesians chapter 1, it says exactly this. That he had to, he had to, he had to have a payment to be paid to buy his church back. And I began to see, as I began to look at this, that no matter what I do, I can't merit the, the love. No matter what I do, doesn't disgrace it that his love will stop loving me. I can walk away from it if I choose. But the love will never stop. What is it going to be like? I had, you know, because I believe it's David that said this. He said, if I make my bed in heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. What is it going to be like? The people that actually didn't make it to heaven, they're in hell. And the love of God is, is there, said, you could have had me but you chose him. That's going to be worse than almost a flame. That I could have had him. I could have had him, but I chose this. I could have had that love, but I chose the hate. I chose this. And see, you see, too many times we allow our emotions to dictate the love of God that's coming towards us. We allow the things that we do actually to, you know, for us to back off and not accept the love of God is showing us. That the love of God is so strong that if we can only see his love, see, what, see that's, that's the difference between Jesus when he's up on this earth. A lot of people say, well, that was Jesus. That's why he was so great. No, he had, he had one thing going above everything else. Let me, let me show you. God the Father had the love. And Jesus loved the church. I know that. But listen to me. Listen. As, I was, as this was going over my spirit. God the Father had the love he wanted to show to the church. Jesus had the obedience to the Father where Father could show that love. Without the obedience of the Son, God couldn't show the love. Am I leaving you off in a, in a cloud somewhere? You've got to see this. That his love is so strong and so dynamic. If, if, if just the church would get a hold of this, the, the, the cheers would be overrunning. They don't know the love of God. They have no idea what the love of God is. They have no idea. They'd rather lay in bed or go do something else on Sunday. That's, you know, for me, that's impossible. I can't do that. I cannot. Not because I'm something great, because one thing that I've, that that happened, that I've, you know, I've looked into it, that love of God, there's not a day that goes by that I don't thank him because he extended his love to me while I was yet a sinner and brought me in. Was I that bad? Yeah, I was going to hell. The worst sinner wouldn't be, you know, you know, it's not going to be any difference. And I, I said, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me that love. That love is the greatest thing that, that, that man has ever known. It's the love of God. It's given to the church. And someone was willing to make the payment. That I don't understand. I don't understand Jesus making a payment for me when I didn't deserve it. That's why he did it. He did it for the undeserving. He did it to show the church how much love he had 
for the Father, because the Father loved the church so much that He wanted to extend His love to the church so much. But He had to have a payment. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, in the New Living. I think it starts verse 3. Yeah, it started in verse 3. I don't have the New Living Bible with me. All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly, the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Keep the saying rolling. Even before He made the worlds, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt me into His own family by bringing me to himself through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the door. Remember John 10.10? 10? I am the door. Yes, yes. Excuse me, John 10.1. I am the door. He said, bring me to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear Son, He paid for us. He paid for us. The love of God wanted to love us, but He needed payment. He said He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom from, excuse me, freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave us our sins. He took that blood and bought my freedom. So I dare say to you this morning, why do you bring your faults in and say, God, don't love me because of your faults, and your faults had nothing to do with his purchase. He purchased you with his blood. And I've tried, to, I've tried with my mind to go there. What was it like for the Father that he knew when Adam and Eve blew it. He walks in the garden in the cool of the day, and he begins to call out Adam. Adam, where you at? He knew where Adam was at. He knows where you're at. Where you at, Adam? Adam, where you at? Then he said, well, we hid ourselves. We hid ourselves because we were afraid. What was it? Sin will separate you from the love of God. It's always there. Yeah. See, it's always there. Pull it on you. Pull it on you. Pull it on you. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. It's, all, it's always there. You can't get away from the love of God pulling at you. Saying, come on back. He said, lean on my love. My grace that has paid for it. And when he did this, did you notice something? That I, I, you know, I've never, I've, I've thought in my mind. How did they cover up themselves? They made loincloths for themselves. How did they do it? Huh? Bible said they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths. Because he said, we did this because we were naked. He said, who told you you were naked? You've been this way ever since you was created. We have no idea how long they were in the garden in this creation. Could have been there for, for weeks, for months. We don't know how long Satan tempted them before they actually gave in to the temptation. Because finally she said, this, this is good to the eyes, and so, so they partake of it. Said The Bible said she ate and gave to him also, and he ate. And their eyes were open, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. I can't comprehend a leaf that you can sew. Have you ever seen a leaf you can take and sew? Sew them together? I, I've never been able to do that. I've seen it, but I, I mean, I, 
I mean, how many leaves would you take of a fig tree to make loincloths? Well, the fig leaves were different. Here's what took place. I could be wrong, but you can't prove it. So therefore, we're going to go this way. I got more proof of the word that this is the way it's going to go. This is the way it happened. That they sewed, they sewed together. But God the Father went out and killed an animal and made claws for him to do away with the fig leaves. This was representing, now notice, when, he, when, when they took an animal and he wrapped it around them, actually inside, if you've ever skinned an animal inside there, there's blood inside that, on, that, on that skin that has to be washed off if you're going to make leather out of it. So actually they put blood around them, didn't they? With the with with skin. They actually covered themselves. Jesus came later. And in, in Mark, the 11th chapter, we find this. Jesus leaving Jer- Jerusalem, going to Be- excuse, Bethany, going to Jerusalem. And on his way, he seen a fig tree far off. See, the Bible says, happily that he might find fruit thereon. But then the next phase, the part of this thing, I could never understand. How could he get happy knowing there was going to be no figs that he could eat, if he, even if they were there? Because the time of figs was not yet. They're not right. You're not going to eat no green fig. They're nasty. I've tried it. Used to live by a fig, tree, fig orchard. I've known it. I know what it's like. Why would he be sad at that fig tree knowing he couldn't eat that fruit, even if it was there? So the next thing he did, he cursed the tree. I've always wondered, why did you curse that tree? You had no business cursing that tree. But then, he knows more than I do, so he cursed it. Then all of a sudden, I begin to see this. They put, God took that fig leaf from them and put blood around them. Here, Jesus cursed the fig tree. And stating, when he cursed it, I said, here's what I've seen. That that fig tree can no longer be your covering. From this day forth, I will be your covering. I thought, I am your blood sacrifice. I am your love package in one thing. I am everything you need. Then I came up with the name, I am. I am. I am. What, what do you need? I am. But yet the church goes through life and never collects upon the I am. When you need something, you don't go to the I am. When we need healing, we don't go to the I am. When you need wealth, you don't go to the I am. We try to figure it out in ourselves. Your brain can't figure out what, how God's going to do it. Not big enough. This one thing you have to leave up to God. But there are principles in the Word of God where love has laid them out. If you do this, walk in this, and here, this is what's going to happen if you walk in this. This is all yours. Belongs to you. And I never could understand in the old church we came from, Brother George, the old church came from, when anything that was going wrong, especially if someone came in there demon-possessed, I would remember people getting in a corner and said, plead the blood, plead the blood. Well, what good is that going to do? If you have no faith, because, because Hebrews 11 and 6 always came back to me. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You can plead the blood all you want. If there's no faith in that pleading, all you're doing is making noise. You're not getting anything done. And see, this is what, what Jesus was saying that day, when he cursed the fig tree, he said, no longer will things of this earth be your covering. That's what he said. There'll be no covering in this earth. Well, no, we got clothes on. It's not your covering. He is your covering. He is your healer. He is your need supplier. Everything you need, love wants to do it for you. Love wants to do it. But yet we, we sit there and never... or. And never call upon what love has already paid for. See, 
God the Father had the love, but Jesus made the payment where love could be extended to the church. If it had never been paid for, he couldn't release it to the church. And the moment he released it to the church, there's not one thing, not one thing, that hadn't been paid for that doesn't belong to you. It's all, it's all yours. When I was looking at this and con- contemplating all these things here, here's what, here's what the Spirit of God said to me. He said, the healing revival has been released upon your church. It's up to you to bring it in. I can't bring it in by myself. I can start it. But you, you can put it out. You can put it out. How do you, how do you put it out? Dead works. No faith. I don't believe it. I've heard this before. This will never happen. Dead works. Dead works. But see, if the church begins to agree what God is saying to the church, that churches in this city are hungry for a move of God, just like us. They're all hungry. They want God. They want Him to move. I was speaking to a pastor this week, and uh, as we talked, I, I got ready to go up to just to leave. And I, and I, said, I said, before I leave, I want, I, want to, I want to tell you just what the Spirit of God said. When you start a healing revival, this is all happened after what God spoke to me. He said, when you want a healing revival in your church, call me. I'll be there. I want to help you. He said, man, I want one so bad in my church. I didn't know that. I want one so I said, I'm not coming to do it. I'm coming just to add my faith to yours where this ain't going to happen. God's getting ready. to. God, God is ready to pour this thing out. His love is ready to be poured out upon the church like never before. And whatever the church needs, that love has and has been paid for. It's already paid for. All we got to do is collect upon what belongs to the church. As I began, to, as I began to just kept looking into this, looking into it, looking into it. I just kept looking into it. That Romans 5, 1 to 8, Romans 5, 1 to 8, back to the King James. I begin to see God. And I begin to think, what pleases him more than anything else? What pleases the Father? What pleases him? Jesus says, I come that nobody be lost. I came here to seek and to save that which was lost. I don't want nobody, I don't want nobody going to hell. His payment is so big, his blood, that every living soul that ever hit this earth has enough payment to pay for every bit of them. Nobody has to be lost. Nobody has to go to hell. Nobody has to go there. Nobody. Because there's enough. Then it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we, we have access by faith into His grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only also, but we glory in tribulation. Also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In other words, things in your life is going to come your way. You're going to hit some bumps. But Paul put it this way, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So when things come, there's no time to cave in and quit. And patience, experience, and experience hope. Keep going, my young man. And hope maketh not a shame, because, look at here, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. We're going to eight. For when we, when we, when we were yet without strength or without Christ, in due time Christ died for us, or the ungodly, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preventure for a good man. Some would even dare to die. Look at this. But God, look at what he said. But God commanded. Think about this. When God commanded something, you think he was messing around? God commanded his love towards me. 
towards me, towards you. He commanded it to you. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. I said, Lord, you died before I was born, way back before I was even thinking of sin. He said, no, you were a sinner before you was even born. Because you came into the sin world. Sin nature was here. You had no choice. When you were born, you were born a sinner. End of the sinning world. But there came a day in your life where you had a choice to choose righteous, choose Jesus, or choose the world. And I've noticed that here's how I see it. Our president lowered the taxes for a lot of people. What did the Democratic Party get up and say? This is no good for you. You know what it's like? God and hell. God does something good, hell stands against it. Every time God does something, hell comes against it. And I begin to see it. Why are they fighting so much? Why? What's going on? We're in the last days. I've never seen Republicans and Democrats so far apart as we see them today. They, 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 they don't agree on one thing. You couldn't give them the love of God and probably the Bible. They couldn't agree on it. It, it doesn't make sense. Therefore, if you ever think the devil is going to make sense out of God in your life, you can, you can, you can forget it. He's going to be against everything you do. He's going to be against everything that God says. He's going to be against everything that's in your life that God wants to bring to pass. And the moment you step out and begin to walk, say, I will walk in this love of God. I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to make a decision. That God's love is what I'm going to walk in. I'm going to live in His love. If you're going to live in it, and you make the statement, you make that declaration, all hell Tribulation is going to come against your, your love walk. He's going to try, to try to trick you up, throw you off, and stop you from loving God. Or especially living on that love. Living in the love is where all the, the miracles take place. You want to see miracles in your life? Get in the love walk. You want to see God prosper you? Get in the love walk. It's all there. And I, you know, and I said, okay, God, I, you know, so... You know, tribulations, let them come. But I make a decision. I'm going I'm to walk out this love walk. Brother Hagen was so, was the reason I watched his life quite often. The reason, the thing I seen the most. The reason he was so successful in what he did, because he said, I made a decision to walk in the love of God. No matter what anybody else does, I will walk in the love of God. When you make that decision, you better be able to stand on your two feet and stay there because stones is going to come your direction. Everything is going to try to bring you off of your love walk. People will say things off of the spur of the moment. In fact, your best friends <laughs> will do things and say things. The, the people you do choose, sometimes you have the most, the most uh, confidence in, will do things and say things that will throw you off. But what you got to remember, God's love is so strong that if you're walking out and stay with it, and stay with it, and stay with it, no matter what happens in this world, you see, once you get on the love walk and begin to get into it, and you begin to confess it. See, here's confessing the word with love, confessing the word with faith. If you confess the word and begin to walk in it, your life will change. It won't change overnight. It takes a while to change your life. It takes a while for you to get in the word of God enough and begin to listen to enough word that you, all of a sudden inside you, begins to change, begins to change, begin to change. Little by little by little, your life will begin to change. God commanded his love towards me. While I was a sinner, Christ died for me to make me just like Jesus. As he is, so are we on this earth. 
But yet we, listen, listen to me. <laughs> I don't need to go there, Father. Okay. All right, listen up. He said, there's a lot of commandments. He said, if you walk in the love of, love of God, he said, you have no problem walking in the commandments of God then. You have no problem. If you're walking, if you're walking in the love of God, you have, no command, you have no problem in those commandments. Then he said this to me. I said, okay. I said, you don't want me to do that one. Huh? I said, okay. The Father says in Ephesians, the Bible says it, because the Father said these things, Jesus was the voice of it. When I say the Father said it, because he was the first one to say it, Jesus became the voice. Then Paul wrote it down, Holy Spirit, by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He said, husbands, love your wife. That's it. As Christ loved the church. I said, that's right. he said, that's a commandment. He said, does that look like a commandment or just a suggestion? I said, it looks like a commandment to me. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. But he said, that's only half of the commandment. I said, half of it? Because you never told the wife to love me. He said, yes, I did. You just didn't look at it. Well, why did you say on the wife problem? He's on, on her side. Wives, be subject unto your husband. Whatever he does, says, you become it. And I thought, well, those are two commandments. Okay. What happens if the first commandment doesn't line up to the, you know, doesn't really fulfill his commandment? What is she going to do? No. But he said, if you ever, if you ever find a husband loving his wife, like Christ loved the church, yes. you have no problem with the wife submitting to that husband and becoming what he wants and what he needs. He said, that's the way the church works. He said, that's the way the church is. He said, when you, he said I, the Father, have given my love to you so great. All you got to do is submit to it. My love is first. I loved you for God so loved. The only thing I'm asking you to do the, the, the bride is to just submit to my love and my love will do anything that you want. It'll do anything. There's not one thing in your life that it will not and cannot do. We're leaving so much on the table that God wants to, wants to be to the church. And if we'll just allow the love of, of God to do this for us, then it is no problem for you loving one another. No matter what happens. We have a strong church, I know it. I don't like the idea of different people, it's not, but I can't, I can't stop it from people just not going to church. I can't stop that. If I would, we'd have a church full right now. We've had enough people come and go, come and go, come and go that we could probably fill two or three of the buildings already. I, you know, what, what is it? What church can you go to to find people like you? No place. You're the best. And I know, as, as a whole, the church walks in the love of God. I remember, this has been right after we started the church, one of the people in the church all of a sudden began to gossip about the pastor to different people. And one of them, I think, I think Ramona came to me, said, Pastor, I just want to let you know what's going on. And when she said that, I said, really? Really? I said, okay, thank you. I went to my closet. Okay, God, what do you mean to do with this? He said, deal with it and deal with it now. Don't let this thing go. This, this in other words, have you noticed... Have you, have you ever done this? You have, a, you, have a, you have a basket of apples. And you had a bad apple over here. You know something? I'm going to take this bad apple and put it with the good, and it'll change the good. It won't? How come? How come? I've got 50 good ones, but only got one bad one. What happens if I put the one bad one around the 50? In time, it'll really rot that whole basket of 50 apples. He said, if you let that one thing stay in there, yes. that one thing, 
that literally begin to, begin to go out and it'll actually rot the church. That's the only time I've really had to handle this at one time. And we did it with, with, with love in our hearts and did everything we could to make it right. But it just wouldn't work. I know when they walked out of the church, they walked out like this. I have never seen that person since. I don't know. I don't know. I've asked God. I've had God say to me, would you have them back in your church? I said, yes, them, but not that spirit. I will not have that spirit in this church. We're aiming for something. We're aiming for, the, for, for a flow of God. We're aiming to where God wants us to go. And, I've, and, and, it's, and it's come up to, you know, at different places at different times that things like that would happen. But the moment it happens, what you do, that you can say, I make a decision that I'm walking in love over this thing. God, I need your, di- your direction in this, what I should do, how to handle it, and what to do with it. Don't get out of sort with it. Don't get upset over it. It's easy. Yeah, I know it. We're all in this human flesh. Here's how, here's how David put it. You're just dirt. You're just dirt. But it's not the dirt that's my problem. It's my soul that it hasn't got born again. He's still in this world. So, but until I get enough word in me to get this soul actually birthed again, because the Bible said the word of God is able to save the soul. It didn't say rebirth it like my spirit. It said to save it. Bring it out of corruption, thinking to get into what God is thinking. But that won't happen if you're never in the Word. It won't happen. You've got to get in the Word. I've pushed this and pushed it and pushed it. If you never read that Word, till you can begin to study it, you will not change. It takes the Word to change you. When Jesus cursed the fig tree and said, No longer will anything in this life be your covering. That's my place. I now will be your covering. I came to cover you. I came to be your blood sacrifice. I came to to, to show you the love of God. And while he was there, he showed what the love of God could do. And I'm I'm here to tell you that Azusa Street is just about to hit the church again. (laughs) Where legs grown out, eyes begin to see, ears begin to hear, Arms begin to grow out. Whatever was missing begins. That Azusa Street 100 years ago, it happened. This is just about to happen again in the church. And when it hits, dear God, we have to be ready. And I heard God say, not only will your church have be full, but to be coming for miles because people are hungry to see the manifestation of the glory of God and the love of God. They're hungry for it. But it won't happen if we don't walk in it. We have to walk in it. If we never walk in it, we'll never be, you'll never know what it can do for you. You have to experience it by walking out the love of God. When God, you know, I've, I've had him many times just, just to show up at my door. Had him, to, when I'm laying in bed, just to show up. Oh, dear God, it's gracious, it's wonderful to have God just come and step into your life. You know, and his glory just overshadows you. And all of a sudden, you don't know what it's for. I've told you this story before, but it came back up. So I I like hearing it myself, so I'm going to tell it to you. We lived on Gulf Road. We had no roses around our house because they were just something we never, you know, we didn't raise at that time. But I was awakened early in the morning with fresh rose smell, strong roses, very strong. And my first thought was, yeah, this time of the year, because it was the spring of the year, this time of the year, roses are very beautiful, they're very strong. My next thought was, oh, we don't have no roses. My next thought was, I said, Lord, that's you, isn't it? Because you're called the Rose of Sharon, the bright and morning star. That's you, isn't it? See, I'm here. And that smell lingered probably for about half an hour and faded away. The next night, he came back. 
I didn't think anything about it. I, but the only thing I know is I enjoyed the company because the love just walks in and stands beside you. It's something for that to happen. And all of a sudden, it just faded away. Not knowing that this was going to happen down the road. I didn't know it. I had no idea. That there was a young man in our life as I was younger. And all of a sudden, his name began to come to my wife and I. We just began to call out his name. We had no idea where he was at. I had no idea. We just began to call his name. We're going to call his name out. This is before the phone told you who was calling. You know, like our phones now, if it's got the wrong people on it, you just punch, and they're gone. They never can call back. Blocked. They're not getting through. They're blocked. But he, he called. And he said, Pastor Ken. All of a sudden, he began to pour his heart out to me. I said, oh, dear Lord, what is it? I said, I'll, I'll be there tomorrow. This is a nine-hour drive. Nine hours, one way. I got up the next morning at 5 o'clock and took off. See, that's, see, I had no idea what God was up to. I had no idea. But I was compelled by love to, to do this. I took off. And when I, when I remember, before I left, I packed a suitcase. I, I wasn't planning on driving there and turn around and coming back. 18 hours of driving, I ain't no truck driver. I ain't no fun. When I got there, I remember he was watching for me because he knew I was leaving. He knew how long it would take me. He was standing outside the motel. He come running, had a suitcase in his hand, opened the door, threw it in, said, let's go. I said, I thought I was going to stay all night. You want to leave in the morning? No, let's go. I said, Okay. I said, is it all right? You know, about an hour or so down the road, can we stop and get something to eat? I've been driving a long time. We'll fill the car up and just be on our way. Okay, we did. Really, you know, it's now sun is setting. We're out in the middle of a desert, coming back home, outside of Bakersfield, out of that, down that desert. We're coming home. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up again. The Rose of Sharon came and sat in the back seat. I knew he was there. I already, see, I've already, see, I knew this. See, this is what love does. He, he prepares you how he wants to use you. And I didn't know what to do with it. I had no idea. Finally, I said, uh, I said, Brother, do you smell anything different in the car that we had, you know, about five minutes ago? You said, do you think? He said, oh, Yeah. The roses out here this time of year are beautiful. I said, we're in a desert. There are no roses out here. There are no roses out here. And then he said, what is it? I knew what it was. He didn't. He was in such a turmoil, he had no idea how to hear what it was. And I said, son, that's the Spirit of God He's sitting right there in the back seat. He come here to minister for you. Yeah. Probably for over an hour or maybe more. Could have been two hours. I don't know. I just lost time. Lost time. That he was sitting in the back seat. And he stood there. He sat there in that front seat. He cried and he cried and he cried. He began to pour his heart out to love, which was in the back seat. To put his life back together. See, I didn't know how, how, for, how for his life had been, been shot. One time he was a pastor of a church. Came home, out on the field, you know, came home, wife wasn't there, walked to the bedroom, went one there, she, back to the kitchen, got to the kitchen, and noticed a letter. She wrote him a letter stating, I'm leaving. I found another guy. This blew his life. Not only that blew his life, but the, but the denomination of the church that he was in, he called him up, told him what took place. What am I going to do now? Here was their answer to his dilemma. Everything will be all right as long as you keep sending your ties in. He goes, you'll never get another penny from me. 
His dilemma started. His life fell apart. You never know when God wants to use you to put some life together. So, but you got to be ready. Without the Word, you won't be ready. In fact, you won't have the opportunity. This happened more than one time in my life. And we're going to begin to see it again. And again. And again. And again. As as he sit there, you know, I mean, him and I, when we got to our house, I don't know what time it was, 11 o'clock at night, when we got there, we were so high that, man, we think we've been, been on something. We were on something. We were <laughs> on high on, uh, what we call, on sweet Jesus. He was, he, he was there so strong. He was there for a long time. Finally, he faded out. I haven't had it since. Will he ever do it again? I don't know. But I've had it in different forms, different forms. He's come, as a, he's come to me as a bright morning star once. But, he, but what he did, he needed to heal somebody, use me as a, he, to lay hands on the sick. And he healed that person in our church that we've gone to. Every time he shows up, he has a reason for it. When love shows up, there's a reason for, it, for him showing up. He needs something. He needs you to be ready to be used by love himself. Love wants to extend himself today to this world. He wants it. He wants you to do it. He wants you to do it. He wants you to do it. If you be ready, he will use you. But you've got to get yourself ready to go. Without the word, you're not ready. You've got to get the word in you. And I begin to, as I begin to go through just his Bible, you know, you know if, you, if you look at John 14, 5 and 6. Okay, I can't, you know, I've only got like four scriptures here and I can't even get through them. But let me show you this one. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know... We know not whither thou goest. Now, they've been with him. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. They've been with him for a while. He's, he keeps telling them. He keeps telling them, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. I'm going to be leaving. They don't even listen. It's like you know, these 12 people not even listen to him. Because he's telling them, I'm going to leave. But where are you going? Where are you going? How can't we know the way? Now, watch his, what he said. Jesus said to him, I am the way. Now watch this. If Jesus is the way, you can't get lost. If he's the truth, you can't be lied to and get away with it. Satan's a liar. If he's the life, you can't die. Talking about your spirit. So here's the truth, the life and the way. So if, he, if, if I can't get lost, and he's my life, and he's my truth. Everything I need is in him. I don't need anything else. But yet, we keep putting off going to the word and finding your life because it's in the word. Your life's in the word. You don't go to, you don't go, you don't go to it. And don't read it with a closed mind. No. When you sit down, God, we're going we're gonna to read this now. I'm asking you to reveal to me what part of this I need in my life today. Yeah. We're going to study this. We're going to study this. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't read it to memorize it. Right. Read it to live it. Yeah. Read it to know it. Read it to walk in it. Yeah. Read it to lay hands on the sick. Read it to give somebody else what you have. And if you do this, your life will change. You won't be the same. I don't know how many, I have plainer to get this. I, you know, I could give you story after story of what God has done in our life. How He's healed, delivered, <clears throat> set free. <clears throat> I 
And I'm long like Trevor. I, I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. But I no longer have to wait. All I got to do is make, prepare myself and walk in it. See, we can sit around and wait all day long, year long, weeks long, months. We can sit, keep saying, I'm waiting on God. No, no, no. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. If you're in him, he's in you. God the Father wanted to release his love. Jesus paid the price, bought it. God the Father then took it and gave it to you. It's all paid for. Now, one thing you have to do, just read the manual, study the manual, walk in the manual, and your life will change. Your life will change. I could probably ask James, you know, how long have you had to go to, you know, because he told me he lost quite a few, few pounds. Did it happen overnight? How come it wouldn't happen overnight? Day by day by day by day, if you've given yourself to not to so much food that puts on weight, you back yourself off, all of a sudden, it begins to show what you did. He told me, I don't know if it's what, right or not, Hilda, he said, told me he lost 70 pounds. Is that true? 75. 75. That wasn't easy. If you want a muscle in your arm, guess what you got to do? It won't happen the first time you lift the weight. You know? I've noticed in the last six weeks, I've had to go to therapy for this one shoulder. So while I'm in there, I decided I'm going to work on my whole body. Because I remember right after, right after surgery, I went out to plant some tomatoes, just 18 vines, my legs would almost hold me up. They were so weak. I thought, dear God, that ain't me. I have strong legs. When I went to therapy, I got on the, got on the leg machine, started pushing, pushing weights on them legs. Them legs are going to keep me going. Those legs, and they're strong now because I needed to hit a golf ball 300 yards again. <laughs> they're there, baby. They're there. They're there. Am I going to do it? I may never do it again. I don't know. If not now, I'll do it in heaven. I'll still outdrive George when I get to heaven. But he'll beat me. Doesn't matter. To me, it doesn't matter. Just a game. Just a game. But we're in, we're, let me put it this way, we're in a war. Satan wants to take you out. You can't let him. You can't let him. What are you going to do? You're going to take the Word of God, stand at your feet, and begin to proclaim what God said to you and about you, and begin to tell the devil who you really are. It's not important that everybody else knows it. You tell the devil. Tell yourself, that's who I am. Too many Christians, they, you, know, I, you know, if I asked a question about you, you could tell me your health, you know, everything. But can you tell me who you are in Jesus? Can you tell me who you are? What are you in Christ? Who, who are you in Him? If you can't tell me who you are, then you don't know who you are. You may have a name, but until you know who you are in Christ, you don't know who you really are. That's who I really am. In Christ, I am a new creature. In Christ, I am, I am the healed. In Christ, I am the delivered. In Christ, I am the prosperous. That's why I say to myself, I'll never be broke another day of my life. And all of a sudden, if a symptom hits your body, even before it hits your body, any germ, any virus touches this body, dies instantly in the name of Jesus. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's not the temple of sickness. That's what you got to tell yourself. That's who I am in Christ. But if you're not doing this, you don't know who you are. You are the healed. You're the delivered. But look what I went through. So what? I went through it. I ain't no back over there. I'm better off now 
than I was before I went through it. I can do more now than I did before I went through it. I said, so look out, world. God has something for the church. Don't stop. Don't go past go. Stop when God says stop. Go when he says go. Get to the point that you know the voice of God. You know who you are in God. You can do all things through Christ. Okay? So uh, go, go read 1 Corinthians 13 chapter. Find out. And when it, every time it says charity or love, that's God specifically talking to you what he, his love will do for you. Never gets in a hurry. Never gets puffed up. Never. 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 You might as well stand up. My clock ran out. It says 12 o'clock. The loving God Okay. Since the healing revival has been poured out on this church, God said we have to act like we own it. We own it. So we're going to begin to pass it out to people on Sunday mornings. We're going to begin to, you know, starting next week, we're going to be asked the question, do anybody here need prayer for sickness? We're going to start, this is something we have to, God says, you've got to start doing this. You may not have nobody for the first week or two weeks, but so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they're going to begin to show up coming in. He said, I'll send them when you're ready. I'll send them. I'll send them. We got enough people in here that can pray the prayer of faith. We got them. We begin to grab a hold of it to the point that we can see it, do it. In other words, in Mark, the 16th chapter, when it says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Then he said, and they shall go forth, proclaiming the word with signs following that's what, what Jesus, when, he's, when he left here, that's some of the last things, the last thing he said. Do this, and this will follow you. Father, thank you that the word. Thank you that we have, the, we have the, the ability, the privilege to walk in love. Thank you for it. Father, I honor you and praise you. Give you glory. This church will walk in love. We'll walk in the, we'll, we'll walk in the word of God. We will proclaim the love, walk in the love, and be loved, and give love. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for that privilege. God, I thank you that the love of God will bring them from the east, the north, the south, and the west, and they'll begin to crowd into this building in the latter days, Father God, and we're there. We're in the latter days. You have poured out your spirit upon us. We receive it. And in the name of Jesus, Father God, I thank you from this day forth, there will be a greater evidence of the love of God in this place than never before. Father, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.